Good afternoon. And today we have a pleasure of interviewing Dr. Fernanda Almeida. Uh, good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. And um, for our audience, if you have a trouble sleeping or sleep next to the snoring partner, please click the like and share buttons. We really appreciate your attention and we want to spread the word about uh, uh, dental sleep medicine as well as sleep medicine. We want to reunite those two fields. And if you're a medical professional, please use our channel as a networking ground. This way we can find the answer to that difficult questions and find all pieces of the puzzle to uh, bring, um, I guess, helpful and restorative sleep to our patients. So again, I want to introduce you to you, Dr. Fernanda Almeida. This is a unique opportunity because she's a practicing dentist as well as a scientist. She's a professor of University of British Columbia, and she has her PhD in a craniofacial science specializing in dental side effects of oral appliance therapy, which we would like to know as well. And she practices in a private practice, so she see clinical part of that science, as well as she teach graduate students of dental sleep medicine, and they um, read the latest uh, scientific articles and learn right from the field. So again, uh, we're very honored to have you here, and we have a lot of questions about scientific and maybe futuristic view on dental sleep medicine, and as well as on uniting these two fields. So my first question to you what would be, you know, cut question. Many sleep doctors do not currently refer uh, to the dentist uh, for oral appliance therapy. And um, what strategies or initiative you could implement to encourage referrals from sleep doctors to the dentist? And I want to understand why it doesn't happen. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Maria Tukalina. Uh, it's a pleasure being here with you and uh, hopefully helping a lot of uh, patients and uh, clinicians uh, to help us all sleep better. Uh, it is a big issue, I mean, in terms of why isn't oral appliance really as well used as we believe it could be. Uh, I mean, at least you and I, we believe it could have been a much higher use and be helping a lot more patients. But there are definitely uh, problems with that. And some of the things, uh, we call them barriers. And so what are the main barriers that we have? And, and we can really understand those because there are other countries that don't have as much, uh, especially in Europe, for example, in France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Sweden, we have a lot more patients on oral appliance therapy. So what I feel that uh, we are missing still here in this country and I'll say for Canada as well, is in part is trust, okay? It's trust between the physicians uh, to the dentist. And that's uh, come in with very, various backgrounds. And one of them, I'll say, it, it started a long time ago when we as dentists started thinking about doing sleep studies, or at least level threes, whatever you want to call, which was saying, and the physicians don't like that. I think there needs to be a nice separation between who does what. So I, that is, is definitely one big thing that we have. My other thing that I do feel is, is almost as equal as important um, in, in many times when you're talking about commercial and I want to be better than this person or better than the dentist next door is actually the industry and how we as dentists are bringing up industry in all of this. Whenever we talk about an appliance, uh, we keep on saying, oh, but this appliance works better than that appliance that works better than the third appliance, which never happens on the CPAP field. In the CPAP, if you talk CPAP, it's CPAP. Doesn't matter who is putting the CPAP on the patient, doesn't matter which mask they do, doesn't matter which brand of the CPAP to do. A CPAP is a CPAP. There is a protocol and you do it. And the same thing we should be doing with the appliance. You know, a mandibular appliance, I know we have two types. Maybe there's the tongue appliances that are slightly different, but for mandibular advancement devices or mandibular advancement splints, they all work the same. We have enough literature showing that they all work the same. If they open the mouth, doesn't open the mouth. If, you know, as long as uh, they connect top and bottom, they push the bottom forward, they keep it forward during sleep, that's great. That's an oral appliance and they all work the same. So I think that's a very important thing. Now, within even the trust, I have to say that uh, it comes a lot of it with cost. And the cost is mainly as well, we have made this treatment too expensive. Uh, 
and they're too expensive because we make it too complex uh, in a way of, uh, you know, be adding up so many appointments, adding up CBCT and, and on and on and on, which it doesn't have to be like that. And so the physicians don't like that they have to send the patients to a treatment, doesn't know if that treatment is truly even going to work because we know that it doesn't work all the time and the patient has to pay upfront all of that much money. So we have to try to understand how to do that. And especially today, I think we talk a lot about disparities. Right. And what are the disparities in, in care for all the population? And we seem to be kind of isolated in, in, you know, the top of the mountain where we only treating the high end of a population and forgetting everyone else. I think Medicare, Medicaid came in and there is definitely the treatment. But the only areas that I see it being fully applied is actually in the VA, for example, which a lot more patients have access. If you talk to the VA physicians, they actually have no problem at all really referring a lot more patients for this field because, again, the, the cost is less, is standardized, and you can actually treat everyone. So I think those things are, are definitely, definitely better. And it's very important for us to kind of try to break those barriers. Oh, thank you very much. It's wonderful how you put it because uh, I have a lot of uh, physicians on, you know, on my channel and they talk about that. Um, and you're right, that trust, very important way. And to develop the trust or like to build the relationship it take years and years. And of course, a patient come back unhappy and usually they unhappy about the cost. They not like they don't care about the treatment, but if they feel better and sleep study is not so good, it's not as important as the bill. Yeah. And yes, so you, whatever you said, that's absolutely right. And I'm going to ask you uh, another question uh, what apply to people who are not in academia, but passionate about dental sleep medicine, like myself and a lot of people, you know, dentists who I brought on my channel, who have some knowledge, uh, practical knowledge, but they have hard time bringing those knowledge as a social proof, like I would say to have it published. And if you can give us some recommendations as somebody who published a lot of articles and, you know, we listen, I personally listen to a lot of lectures, you know, what can be the advice of somebody who want to be like you, but not in academia? Uh, that's really, really good. And I think that's something that happens a lot in medicine, actually. A lot of physicians keep on collecting data and get it published uh, within other groups. Uh, so one of the big things as an answer for that would be collaboration and collaboration with an academics. Uh, I know that, I mean, I do see a lot of patients in my practice, although it's just a day a week, but I tend to see about 25, 30 patients in a day. So a lot of the questions uh, that I have comes from there. A lot of the things, well, I did something and it worked. Can I put that into a, a paper? or how does it work? The main thing then with this collaboration, I'll say, is, is look for someone like me, uh, someone in academia who, who understands this, how to do it. So instead of, uh, as we always say this, well, if I say, okay, but this really works in my hands, how can I prove it works? First, that's the wrong thing. You don't want to say, this works, I want to prove it works. Just why? No. You have to step back and say, first of all, in a non-biased mind, shall I prove it? Does this make it better or make it worse? You still could make it worse. And then you have to say, okay, what shall I do to prove it that it's actually one way or the other? So that's someone like me who would say, okay, you want to test uh, and maybe you have, oh, but I did this five things all together. I said, well, no, no, let's take two of those and we can test. And I can guide you say, okay, from now on, you randomize a patient, everyone who comes in, and you have to be one this way, one that way, or in a random order, because we always have a little bit of a bias in our of mind. Course. I think this patient, that would work better, you know? So once you get a little protocol from someone like me, you can run it. And uh, then at the end, it's often very hard to understand what all the data is. And that's the time that you come back to someone like me who helps it. And I have to say, we have been successful in doing that, not too, too much, but we have uh, published articles, for example, with Michael Adami, which we have published on the CPAP and all appliance connectors. I have many years ago published some data with Jonathan Parker with his overnight titration. So yes, these things can happen, they can do, be done, but the answer here would be collaboration. Uh, and yes, we need that. We need that a lot. And I would encourage every clinician to do it.
Thank you very much. It's such an encouraging answer to a lot of clinicians like me. So thank you. And now I want to go back to oral appliance therapy or to therapy of sleep apnea. Uh, I would say compliance is a critical aspect of treatment with oral appliance. Um, what, ad I mean, it, not oral appliance, uh, compliance is a critical uh, question on sleep apnea treatment in general. And what advancement you foresee in improving patient compliance in the future. And I love what you put it in your lecture and in your article, what I listen on American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine conference. Okay, so I think we are coming into uh, an era of uh, patient self-monitoring, uh, right, where patients would really be aware of what is going on with them. So they probably will have some kind of a monitor to understand, are they getting better, are they getting worse, are they sleeping well or not sleeping well. So that's definitely one of the things that is a big part, which is patient engagement to therapy. But the therapies that we have today are pretty cumbersome. They don't work all the time. You know, we have a lot of what we talk about this personalized therapy, uh, which we talk often in medicine things about, you know, endotype, phenotype, genetics, and this, which is all very good, but it's all on our views of the patients, okay, and how does disease work and so on, and maybe this will be better for this patient or that, but we forget to understand what this patient wants for the therapy. So you can only achieve high compliance if you're actually targeting the needs of the patients, okay, so what does that patient specific need? So you have in many ways tried to find kind of the right treatment for the right patient, but also at the right time. OK, so that often that patient is in a time that it is in a new relationship and they won't be using the CPAP. But, you know, maybe in a year when that relationship is sedimented and they have a wearable, let's say, to know, oh, but my apnea is not that well controlled. I'm a little bit more tired. I go back to CPAP. So that's one way of looking at it. But even the appliance or the CPAP, they seem to be uh, often not ideal in terms of compliance or any of the other ones, positional therapy and so on. So one of the, our new research that we are about to publish is going away from unimodality into multimodality therapy. What I mean with that is that every patient shouldn't have at home only one type of therapy. Uh, the therapies that we have today are very intrusive, okay, so they are hard to use, even the appliance or the CPAP, even positional therapy, you have to have something on you to go to sleep. The medications that are going to come are likely going to have side effects if used long term and things like that. So on a day to day basis, if the patient have more than one treatment to choose from, like, for example, tomorrow I have a meeting early in the morning and I don't want to have the marks, the marks of my CPAP, I put an appliance in. Uh, well, but then tomorrow I really, you know, have something in my teeth. I want to actually have a breakfast with really hard nuts. I know that my teeth may not feel so good. So I put the CPAP on. So you can choose on a daily basis what to change from. What we have seen in our studies actually after a whole year of being in the trial and actually after six months of being on this, uh, having both treatments to go between them, 86% of the patients were actually called adherent to treatment, which is unheard of. Okay, so it's a major adherence to treatment, which we'd never have. A lot of patients would be, you know, going back and mm -hmm. forth between the two and alternate days. But we actually had quite a few patients that would start with the CPAP. And at, after normally about three hours, they remove the mask and they actually would put the appliance in. So even within the same night, they could actually have both. And with that, what happens is often they may say, well, the appliance doesn't work so well, but it still attenuates the disease. And instead of you having that CPAP on nothing and CPAP on nothing, you would be doing really like this attenuation and you can be fluctuating between therapies. You could be using some days positional therapy. You can be, you know, so you need more than one therapy to have at home on a daily basis if you're looking at long term. We're treating a chronic disease. We cannot think about a week, a month, or six months of treatment. We have to think about a lifespan. So things change. They, they, they change day to day. They change week to week, month to month, year to, year to year. So those things are important. Of course, they have to come with a lot of education for the patient. And patients shouldn't, uh, you know, understand all. So we need as well or they shouldn't, they can't often understand it all. So we need also our help and the physician's help to keep 
the patient's understanding of what are the disease, what is the readings that they're getting for their, their portable monitorings on themselves, and how are they managing the disease? Is there a new comorbidity arriving, blood pressure or anything like that? So then you have to, to move on. But I think that's very, very important is moving away from unimodality into multimodality therapy. I like that. And I want to um, ask you a couple things about that. Number one, we're talking about, you know, variables, biohackers, something that you can monitor on an everyday basis. Please tell us what parameters you, the patient uh, or the doctor, have to recommend for the patient, you know, by variables based upon what you think is important. So they are a lot, right? And if you just Google it, you're going to be this wave of uh, all kind of monitors that you can have. And uh, the main thing is, is which one to choose. It first de depends on what is your problem, right? So what is the main issue you have? If you have already been poorly diagnosed and thing, and your main thing is sleep apnea, okay? So that's what we are actually talking about. So I'm going to be focusing on, on that side of things. Of course. Um, so the one thing that we know is you have to somehow be measuring how is the sleep apnea going? How many events are you having? Often most of the monitors that can do that quite well are the oximetries or the ones that measure oxygen in your blood. Of course, not everyone who has sleep apnea has drops in the oxygen, but that's one way of doing it. When we looked at anything that measures oxygen, we have a lot. But the problem is that a a lot of those changes in the oxygen in our blood with the with uh, the apneas, they are normally very quick. So you need to have some kind of a monitor that measures many times, actually per second. So you need to have that really onto that spectrum to have something there. We tend to, of course, uh, only look at the monitors that have been validated by research. Uh, so it's often when you look at the websites, they're going to say, oh, it's been validated by whom okay so if you have truly research study if they normally attach this are our research studies on this then you can actually know that they have been truly proofread to truly be measuring sleep apnea there are some that just look at flow that's a lot of with the oxygen there's some that looks at the jaw position so they are all different types out there but you need to see which one has been validated Okay, so, and then, of course, it comes in other things. So it, comfort, you know, I like something on my wrist. I like something on my finger. I like something on my cheeks uh, or on my head. Uh, what is your choice of things? So I, I believe that that's how things are going to move, and people need to do that. But one thing that I really like of most of the monitors that are coming with is that they don't measure just the sleep apnea per se, but they also measure sleep. One of the big things that we have today in the society is not enough sleep. And we know a lot of literature has been coming on. And it's not just this quality of sleep that you cannot have sleep apnea. You still need hours of sleep. We need to go back to sleep more. And the restrictions of sleep has been linked to all sorts of disease that you want to talk about it. with even strong influence about hours of sleep than even sleep apnea often. Okay, so we need to, to do that. And with all those trackers, they normally have that part with an accelerometer or something like that, that you can look at it. And again, validation between sleep, not sleep, not so much sleep stages. I wouldn't pay that much attention to it uh, because often patients say, I don't have enough deep sleep. And those are the least yet uh, accurate ones. But at least are you sleeping enough, enough hours? Are you giving yourself enough hours in bed to sleep. And if needed to be, you also need to treat an insomnia uh, and, and things like that. It's not just staying in bed, but staying asleep. So I think all of those are things that I look for any monitors that I would be recommending to my patients. Excellent. And I'm going to ask you a couple last questions. Number one, what do you think about modern way of measuring sleep apnea? A lot of you know, part of your article devoted to AHI and, you know, it was a significant topic. What do you think about that and how we should look at the sleep apnea measurement? Yeah, so I think AHI has been uh, coming for many, many years and a lot of measurements have changed. They have a major evolution in, in all the things that we know, but we still kept using that AHI, which is often flooded. Uh, so the a lot of research today and a lot of efforts are done today to try to find the metrics that truly correlate to outcomes. Uh, 
Okay, so what is truly going to correlate to higher incidence of cardiovascular disease? What is really important for me to understand that patient is going to be more rested, less sleepy, uh, and things like that? So that's where the bulk of research now has been devoted towards, and I see a lot of research on it. Uh, and a lot of it is also in terms of brain waves activity and how can you actually sleep in a so-called deep sleep, which is not just even the simple stages of sleep that we talk about. It's very much more advanced than that. So with all of that, we will understand better than that AHI. The other thing that I like to point out about that AHI is that because it was also the only metric we had to, or not the only, but the, the one that we mostly paid attention for many, many years, it's still the only metric that you use for treatment outcome success, which is again flawed as well, right? So we forget to see, okay, but how much did that, that treatment improve, for example, blood pressure? How much did it improve sleepiness? How much did it actually meet the patient expectations okay so if for the patient that they feeling great and that's awesome and they sleeping enough hours and sleeping well that's probably a success but we i do believe we still need objective measures because there's still placebo effect and other things that come with it but that probably something there that we are just not measuring with the current measures of ahi alone so we need to move away from it i'm very happy to say that you know, a lot of researchers are really working quite hard on this metric. And I'll say, stay tuned, because soon we're going to have major changes and major and important uh, methods for measuring not just who has the disease and who has not, but also mm -hmm. who gets a good treatment and who doesn't. Yeah, that, that, that's nice. That's kind of your answer. My last question about futuristic approach uh, towards the medicine. So we have to really define who has disease or not. Thank you very much, doctor. Really appreciate your, you know, uh, refreshment on a scientific pathway of dental sleep medicine. And um, we're looking forward for more of your discoveries. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you very much for having me.